welcome to, to all of you. I'm uh, Henrik Sangberg, uh, the CEO of uh, Sangberg Analytics. And with me today I have... Ravish Kupal, I am uh, head of SIG's Nordics office. And who's SIG and who's uh, Sangberg? We have some clients that doesn't know you and mm -hmm. uh, some clients that doesn't know me. Uh, so uh, I think I'll head off by, uh, by saying uh, we welcome you to this uh, Sangberg webcast. Sangbear is a benchmarking company. Uh, we do benchmarking across a number of areas. Uh, IT operation is, is really where we came from. But we do a lot of uh, software benchmarking and we do a lot of uh, AMS, application maintenance uh, benchmarking. Uh, and and uh, during the last year, uh, we've uh, moved into uh, to, to the area of, of agile uh, development and how you can actually measure stuff uh, in an agile program and that's basically what we're going to talk about today from from our side but i'm extremely pleased to um, to have you here ravish because i think your company and you should explain about your company uh, really uh, holds the, uh, the the golden keys to 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 an area that we believe is extremely important and something that we can't do uh, that has to do with quality exactly so, so tell us a little bit about yourself and, 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 and SIG. Yes, SIG, which stands for the Software Improvement Group, is also a benchmarking company, uh, but with a focus on software quality, mm -hmm. software construction or build quality. So SIG specializes in the measurement of software quality, the benchmarking of this quality, and provides monitoring services. And we do that with a combination of technology. We have a platform that we'll demonstrate later, as well as consultants. So we have in-house expertise. And using that combination, we help organizations to develop better software and thereby get a gain and a grip of control of software development. Great. And, and we believe that it's a really beautiful synergy between the uh, financial approach that we have to uh, to everything i mean if there's not money involved we don't really care here in, in Bielstra. but uh, at the uh, Brega, yeah, where yeah, you live yeah, yeah. at Brega, uh, you're much more concerned with uh, with the quality point with the quality aspects and combining those two things we believe is extremely uh, relevant and 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 can can provide a lot of insights so, so we are very enthusiastic about this, but also the, the webcast today is, is it's not only about all the, the beautiful things we can do, it is really about what what the problem is. Uh, so, so what is the, the, the problem with productivity and quality and agile development and how could you address it? But just understanding the problem in the first place, we believe is, is extremely important. So whether you I mean, obviously, you should all buy a lot of services from, from our two companies, <laughs> but whether you do that or not, we believe that, that what we are going to show you today will, will give you a, a number of in, important insights into understanding those missing parts of, of, of many agile programs. This is the presentation with Henrik and Ravish, so even better. So the agile dilemma, quality and productivity, so, so what, what really is the problem? Um, and the problem is really, what do I get for my money? Because and that's a question that, that more and more of our clients are asking, saying, OK, so, so when I did traditional waterfall development, I could actually describe the problem. I could put it out for a tender. I could actually see uh, whether, I, I mean, I could compare offers I got from different, uh, different uh, vendors. Those vendors would have gone through a, a, a process of breaking down the problem, estimating the different parts of of, um, of the job. Some of them would have had great ideas on how to solve the problem yeah. and thereby perhaps providing us with a cheaper solution. But we would actually, before we started, we would have an idea of, of, of the magnitude and the, and the financials. And then obviously everything would go wrong as, as we go. I mean, that's the problem with, with, with waterfall. It was a simplify at the moment of buying. <laughs> exactly. It was, uh, but, but, but we would have an, an idea of the magnitude and we could recalibrate as, as we went along. Yeah. 
Um, so, so, and, and not to say that that waterfall is uh, is the solution to everything. It's definitely not. We believe agile is great, but but agile presents us with a new problem. Really, the problem of the different teams we that where we have allocated basically we've allocated the money to the teams. We've allocated the 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 man hours to the teams, and and we get what we get. So once they've completed a sprint, this is what we've got for our money. Yes. And, and, and we do have clients that say, okay, I do have that feeling that uh, this team A, actually they're able to produce a lot more code in their sprints than team C. But, 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 but how is that? And, and uh, is, it, is that just a feeling I have or is that real? Um, so, so, um, so, so, and and it gets down to the uh, to to the notion of productivity. So, is one team more productive than the other? And not only that, at the beginning, every every team seems so productive, mm. but then yeah. a couple of months and even years in, that same productivity is no longer there. And what lies behind it? And and at the end of the presentation, we will actually look at some of the the root causes, some of the underlying problems we'll touch a bit upon that right now but in the next few minutes but 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 we can go deeper into that but it, but, but of course this has to do with uh, basically the dynamics the 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 of the dynamics of the team is it is it a well functioning team do they work well together but but obviously it also has to do with the competences there uh, the experience of the team and the complexity of the task that they are going to uh, that they they're trying to solve so there's a lot of factors going in uh, into to, uh, into that problem. Okay, so to put this in a dollar and cents kind of way that we like to do, we say, okay, so it, if you had in a in a perfect or modeled world, you had this traditional waterfall approach to developing a system. What will happen in a waterfall? Uh, approach is that you will develop functionality that you will not use yeah. because at the point of requirement specification you believe you are you are maximum clever but but you're not uh, as you start developing and that's basically the idea of, of the agile approach as you start developing you get insights you find out that problems could be solved in different ways you don't really need this functionality because you could do something else i mean a lot of things happen and you essentially work with the fact that you cannot predict the future. Exactly. And with the waterfall approach, you assume that and you don't really do that. And that. Exactly. And, and in the wasted box, you, you, you have also things that are, were needed at the time of specification. But context has changed uh, and, and now you don't need these, these things. So yes, a waterfall approach will lead to wasted functionality. And, and I think the, the primary benefit of Agile, now there's a lot of benefits to Agile, uh, but one of them is that, that you, you have the opportunity to basically not develop that big chunk. It could be a very big chunk of wasted functionality. So that's, the, that's one of the benefits. And from a financial point of view, that's a benefit, but it actually, for, for that to happen, it requires that you have the same productivity as you had in the traditional waterfall uh, approach. And the, in the traditional waterfall approach, one, one thing about um, productivity is that you usually will, the vendor or whoever is going to, to, to develop uh, the system, had, will have broken down uh, the the the, uh, the development task into smaller tasks, and every one of these has been uh, estimated. And you will follow up on that estimate, yeah. uh, right? And you will say, okay, so we estimate this task to be 100 hours. Now we've spent 200 hours. Why is that? And that's basically two uh, two potential uh, explanations. It was a, a it was a bad estimate, and everybody around the table said that was a bad estimate. It's much more complicated. But the other is no; these people developing this, they are simply incompetent. They are, they are not skilled enough. So it should have been done in 100 hours. Right. So if the productivity in an agile team is lower, uh, um, and 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 you don't catch that, 
well, then you will have higher cost. And whether that so that final bar on the right will be higher than that final bar on the left, well, that depends, of course. And it very much depends on the productivity of the agile uh, teams. So, so productivity is obviously uh, is obviously a, uh, an important part of, 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 of this equation. And there's a lot of, of, of challenging challenges in managing agile development teams. And, and in, in some cases, it seems a little like now I'm I'm drawing a caricature, but 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 sometimes it it seems like uh, success is when everybody is happy. So everybody everybody in the art is happy. We we believe we we develop beautiful software. Now here in, in Pilstrad, we believe that's good. Happiness is nice, uh, but but we believe that productivity and value for money is nice as well. So. So, so the variance in productivity within and between teams is a challenge. And, and I think everybody yeah. working with safe or agile frameworks have seen those teams that spiral down into a poorer and poorer productivity until the point where it's obvious to everyone that this team doesn't perform. But until that point where it's obvious to everyone, they're just bad performing. Yeah, I mean, they're just, uh, not really delivering what they should deliver. And do you have the tools to identify that? And that means that up, up until that point, you're overpaying. You are overpaying. And and if this is an, I mean, in, I think we should distinguish, and, and we do that on this slide as well. There's a problem if it's, if it's insourced, but it's even more important if it's outsourced because you have, I mean, and, and we see this a lot in in, uh, in outsourced or partly outsourced uh, agile development products projects. We see this problem of variance in productivity <laughs> among the vendors teams, and that's obviously not acceptable. I mean, you should require a con a, a, a basically a if not constant, then at least a consistently uh, a consistent um, uh, productivity uh, across uh, the teams and, and not accept lower uh, performing teams. And that essentially is really a conundrum because when you go for the outsourcing option, assume that that is managed. This company is capable of uh, consistently producing the same kind of uh, output across the teams that it has. But as we say, uh, learnings from all these years of doing software engineering, when it comes to outsourcing, you want to outsource effort, but not knowledge. And that also comes to the knowledge of managing these agile teams. And I think what we are experiencing right now is that the lack of resources in the market, yes. right, really, I mean, accelerates this problem. Because what the vendors do right now, and, and I don't blame them, and I think for, for the society it's good, they take in a lot of inexperienced people and train them. But where do they train them? They do not train them in their own universities and schools. They train them on projects. On the job. Yeah. On the job, which is also okay. I mean, uh, to, to, to the point where, where you, you don't overpay for the untrained resources, but you need to... You really need to be aware that if the vendor basically have a team composition of too many inexperienced people, the, this will spiral down into poor productivity. Yeah. And, and you need to be able to measure that. Uh, because as we say uh, on, the, on, the left, uh, on the left bottom, team performance requires the right skills, the right culture, the right processes. So, so, so they need, and does the company have the right processes in place? Is the culture right? Or has that been eroded by basically taking in too many people or whatever? You need to be aware of that. And, and we've had a, a number of projects here in the last two years. We're actually going back to that, and that, that is really the, the root causes we're talking about. That I'm looking at the time. We might be able to talk about root causes at the end, but we, yeah. we have the centerpiece of our presentation is Revish yeah. demonstrating the, the coolest tool so, so, uh, in, in a short while. Uh, and, um, and I think we will spend a lot of time on that. So, so I'm not really sure, but now you know the, the headlines of, of, of uh, 
of the, the some of the root causes. Um, so so it 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 really is important uh, if you do it in, internally. It's even more important when it's outsourced because you have less feeling for what's going on because you're not in control of those processes and, and stuff like that. Yeah, so essentially when it comes to the outsource situation, your control needs to be more explicit. So SAFE is a wonderful framework. Uh, it has a lot of, of, of KPIs and key metrics and so on. Um, and, and, and two uh, observations on that. One, uh, a lot of uh, organizations struggle with getting just the, the basic safe key metrics and KPIs in place. Okay, that's one thing. Go, I mean, and, and the only recommendation from here is go do that. But even if you implement the safe framework end to end, you will not get uh, the, the right tools to actually solve the productivity issue. For some reason, this has not been built into the SAFE framework. Which is uh, very surprising because the framework is comprehensive, it's large and very uh, prescriptive in a lot of areas, but not so much in, in this part. No, and you can have all kinds of uh, hypotheses as, as to why that is and what kind of people developed the, the SAFE framework uh, and, and th there were not perhaps any economists in the room. We will not speculate on that. We'll just say that uh, that there's there's some part missing and, and, and we believe that, that those parts are exp actually what we're going to show you a little bit about today. So what we are missing instruments in the cockpit, that, that's the real problem. Um, and, and one of the things that we will dive into uh, in, in a short while is, is the, the issue of, of AMS, application maintenance. So basically, you have an art, an application, uh, sorry, an agile release train, they're developing this cool new system. Yeah, and for those not familiar with that, agile release train is a collection of multiple agile teams working on the same big uh, company objective. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> and, 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 and as they move along, spending a lot of hours, a lot of money, uh, they will produce cool new code. But some of the, a, a portion of the time, they will spend on maintaining old code. It might be the code they developed earlier in the agile release train, or it might be code that was developed prior to, uh, to the uh, instigation of this, of this art. But they will spend some time on AMS. Uh, on application maintenance. And application maintenance is basically fixing bugs, upgrading to new versions of operating system, patching stuff. I mean, all the things you need to do to make sure that the system itself still works. Um, um, and, and the question is, okay, first of all, do you know how much time you spend on AMS? Most, most agile teams and agile uh, programs don't. So, so they don't really know how much time they spend on this. So is it 10% of your time or is it 30 or 40% of your time? And obviously the more time you spend on AMS, the less time you have to develop new uh, code. Yeah. So what makes this even harder is that a part of this time is hidden. You can track some things explicitly by tasks, but there's also a part of it hidden by just developing code. Oh, exactly. So, so this is not easy, but it's not impossible to get an, a, an idea of the AMS uh, percentage. And now the question is, of course, okay, we spend a lot of time, or these teams spend a lot of time on, on AMS. Why is that? Is that because of the quality of the code? Because they developed crappy code in the last two sprints or three sprints, and now they just spend time fixing the errors um, uh, on that. Is, that. is that the case? Or is it um, because uh, the, of the nature of, of what they're working with? Every team working with this, with this um, uh, code complex would have to spend a lot of time on AMS. So, so it's, it's more intrinsic to, to, to what we're working with. It's, it's actually okay. And, and, uh, and obviously, um, uh, obviously on looking on that, uh, uh, on the AMS percentage, 
there's also a financial aspect. So could we have done this in a smarter, cheaper, uh, more efficient way, basically taking that out? So, so that's that's one part. So, so, so the entire AMS uh, instruments in the cockpits missing, uh, and also the instruments showing us why is it that uh, we have this percentage. Uh, the, the other is, of course, do we have some kind of instrument that, that allows us to see the output per FTE? So, so in, in SAFE, there is an output measure. It's called uh, story points. Yep. 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 Sorry. <laughs> but, but the problem is it's not an objective uh, normalized metric that you can use across projects or clients or anything. So, so, so it's, it's not objectified in a way that, say, those of you old enough to know function points or, or other measures that are more objectified. So, so it's difficult. And this one we'll get back to. This is actually difficult. Um, and then, of course, is the staff composition too expensive? So we we talked about before, we talked about uh, do you have too many inexperienced people, but actually too many highly experienced people for a simple task is also uh, bad, of course, for, 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 for the economy uh, of, of the project. So, so do you have the right mix to the task at hand of experienced and less experienced people? And then, of course, the governance overhead. I mean, everybody is happy, but nobody's coding. Um, is there a lot of people talking about the code? And then there's one guy in the corner just trying to get, you know, just trying to close the door so we can actually code the system. So is the governance uh, overhead too high? Um, yeah, and but how much watching is there versus doing? Exactly. And, and, and this, of course, uh, is, is that a matter of, of I think and I feel no, there is, there, there are, this can be benchmarked as well. I mean, so, so what is the best practice given the complexity, given uh, the size, given uh, the nature of what you're doing? Obviously, you can, you can benchmark uh, the governance overhead and, and discuss whether that is too high. Yeah. Um, the, the other part of the problem is the reliance on experienced people. Now, we we've, we've talked to some of, of the la of the biggest software developers in the world, people that just develop software, and and um, and we've talked to them about how they go around this, and it's funny when they talk about it, they say, well, it's not really a problem, Henrik, because everybody managing stuff here used to be a, a developer, so everybody can actually they can smell bad productivity miles away. They can see it. They can recognize it. From they, their own experience. From their own experience. Uh, so, so, uh, but th that luxury is not available in, in to, to normal companies. They have to rely on a lot of people that are product owners and different roles in 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 in, in the framework that have little experience or no experience with actual development. And this is actually something that is forgotten about the origin of Agile. The, 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 the manifesto writers, and also the, those who practiced Agile at the start, those were very experienced senior software developers. And if you put a bunch of those together in one team with all their, let's say, war stories and all this experience in different business domains, yeah, then they are capable of self-organizing and being very productive producing something of value every iteration. But if you then take that idea and you start filling the team with mostly juniors and maybe one or two seniors, then you do not get the same output. And managers that are managers, but not have a background in, in, in this. And, and we're not saying, okay, go go change this. You can't change this. No. I mean, th this, this is how it's, I mean, those are the people available to do stuff in, in normal or, uh, organizations. Especially so, in today's market. And especially in today's market where there's a, a, a huge demand uh, and, a, and a very limited supply of those experienced people. Yeah. So, uh, so there's a risk of a high TCO on AD and AMS compared to market average. There's uncertain true cost to complete. So, so actually, it's, it's, it, it also, because if you don't know the productivity, and it, those of you are familiar with CMM, 
CMMI and and, and other uh, frameworks that that works more systematically with productivity and 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 ability to estimate and and and, and uh, forecast will know that this is actually quite important if you don't know the productivity even accepting poor productivity down in this team if you don't know that you will be very poor at at uh, at at estimating the true cost and time yeah. to complete whether whether complete is is known or less known and and then of course there is this one more defensive estimates will tend to be self fulfilling so how how do you become a success in today's agile setup without productivity measures at all you set the expectations low so yeah, that you know that you can exceed them every time yeah that's what teams will do generally yeah it's like you know when you have children and you go in and say could you tidy up your room and they say yeah i think end of next week no i i mean now yeah, what what about the, i mean setting the expectation low you you will be able to exceed so um yeah so so that's that 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 is the part of the problem and just to say our approach sangbear's approach is a benchmarking approach in, it's a financial benchmarking approach. Yeah, and, we, and we like that. But we're also all about benchmarking. Yeah, benchmarking is good. It's, it's God, actually. Uh, it gives you an idea. And, and, and I think, I think the, the important part here is benchmarking does not give you the, the absolute truth, but it gives you an idea of where you are and what issues you need to, to tackle and what issues you don't need to focus on. Yeah, and it takes away uh, the subjective element. It takes away a lot of the subjective element. And basically what we do, we benchmark AMS. We do that outside of, 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 of these uh, agile frameworks. So we benchmark large 100 million Danish kroner uh, deals of, of uh, AMS where... And in euros, that is? Yeah, divide by seven, <laughs> I think. Isn't it 7.45? So that would be... Uh, tw tw uh, some of them are... are, are at least if that would be 15, 15 million euros plus a year AMS uh, deals. So, so we help companies benchmark those kind of deals, uh, outsourced AS, SAP benchmark, yeah. AS, uh, application maintenance. And then, of course, on, on the AD uh, application development. And I think we'll get back in the end a little bit about benchmarking application development has always been a, a problem. Uh, because it's 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 extremely difficult. And there Henry, are, can you yes? hear me? Yeah, there's a question for you in the chat, please. Okay, could you read it to me? Because I have, I think, seventy yeah. windows open here. Uh, it's a good way to benchmark productivity that is not just based on experienced managers' past experiences. Yes, uh, and that is that is I think that that is what we are going. I mean, in a short while, we'll show you that, show you that, and how to do that. We'll show you different ways to do that, but but where you objectivize it. Uh, so yes, so we'll get to that. Um, so so uh, so we'll do that, and that's the middle part. So yes, you can do it. It's difficult. It doesn't have the same. It doesn't have the same. Um, yeah, there, there there are some issues to to doing that. But it gives you a very, very good idea of uh, where you are in on 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 a scale of from from poor to uh, excellent. I think the point is that it's a repeatable approach that you can use for comparison. And, uh, and and just to say, we come from the financial point. We do have some 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 stuff here, but but the reason we are very excited about having uh, SIG here today is because they have an approach that's that basically measures quality and translate that into into the on the on the technical on the software side. yeah so so that's basically a bottom up approach that that we really really like uh, and believe is it has a lot of uh, of merits to it and we'll get there um, and then of course staffing composition rate card benchmarking that's something we do so we basically going back so how do you how did you what what does the staff composition look like in your team we compare that to to other clients say Okay, so this is very top heavy, or this is uh, very the the the, um, the the governance overhead is, is far too high, or so at least it's higher than the peers. And and the rate cards, what are you paying for the different classes of consultants, local, landed, uh, uh, nearshore, offshore? We benchmark that. 
we benchmark that in 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 uh, we benchmark that for agile teams, but we benchmark that in general. So so that that kind of triangulate a number of of the financials. So the AMS part, we take that out, we benchmark that. Uh, we we look at the uh, at the AD and amplify that can amplify that with what we're going to see soon. And we look at, at, at the unit cost. So what do you pay per hour for experienced, more experienced, very experienced people? Yes, I think time is running. Uh, oh, I, I will go through this uh, and, and pretty fast, but, but just to say this, this uh, is, is expanding on, on, on the notion of, of the division between AMS and AD. And, and basically what you need to do is you need to find a way to split the effort that has been done in, 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 in the last sprint into what was AD and what was AMS. Um, and, um, and, and we do get a lot, I mean, the, 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 there's a number of general benchmarks saying, if you are running a, a agile release train and you get above 20, 25% in AMS, you really should consider whether that is a, a viable approach going forward. You might want, you might end up saying it's okay, but, but, but looking across and basically going to the large software uh, producers, the, um, the, the, the learning there is that as soon as you get above those 20%, uh, uh, it becomes extremely expensive. And this is not only a, a point in time measurement, trying to have a baseline, but you also definitely have to uh, keep track of how this is developing. Because uh, without any measurement, without any control, this percentage will increase over time. Now you're asking, how can we measure that? I'm glad to say that this is uh, ba this is one of the outputs of, 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 of the tools that SIT can, can apply. There are other ways, of course, but, but this is a great way to do it. Um, so, and, and once you have that, basically, uh, you know that you spend so, so and so much time on, on AMS, you can calculate the cost of that and you can benchmark it. And what you will find, uh, and, and this is almost a guarantee, is that, it, that if, if this is above 20%, the cost associated with that AMS will be in the sky compared to, to the obvious alternatives. The obvious al alternatives is of course, to place the AMS job somewhere else. I mean, outsource it or, or at least, uh, and, and consider offshoring options and stuff like that. So, so in, in uh, agile program AMS is the most expensive way to do AMS, full stop. Because of the, the governance overhead, because of, of uh, the, the use of, uh, of, of the typical use of, of local resources, the, because of, I mean, because of all the things that that that's part of the AMS framework, and because of the lack of uh, productivity measures in many cases, it it is extremely expensive. And I think we have uh, later on we 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 have we have some actual examples that uh, where we've measured and and benchmarked that. So one, you you're wasting your money. I mean, that's one thing. But you're also wasting the the capacity of your agile teams, which is even more important. So they're spending time on AMS where they should be spending time on developing new code. So the output will be smaller. You will have less output. And that essentially means that for every sprint that you're paying, every iteration, you're getting less output than what you're paying for and what you expect. So, now, th this one is just saying, okay, you need to take the data where the data is. And, and, and um, there is uh, the commits data where you commit the new code into to the code base. That in itself, without looking at the code, can give you some, some, some basic, uh, basic metrics. You can basically, you can see whether you have committed code that, that was there already. So it's most likely AMS or whether you're committing new code and you can do some, some rough estimation on, on that. So based on commits data, yeah, you can get an idea of, um, of, of, of the AMS percentage. But there are more 
accurate ways uh, than that, but that, that is a way. The ITSM data, uh, the, the incident data, I mean, a lot of the uh, AMS uh, tasks are initiated by an incident a problem. Uh, if you have those data, uh, then you basically, uh, together with the commits data uh, and, and the AMS percentage, then you have something that's benchmarkable. Because now you have the, the, the volume and, and the nature of the AMS task and uh, the effort that went into it, now you can start benchmarking. Now the source line of codes uh, on, on the bottom right, uh, left, the, the source line of codes is, is, is a, it's, it's not a very good measure of anything because you'll have two programmers that uh, will solve the same problem with different uh, number of lines of code. And, and you don't, I mean, you have to inspect the code to actually find out whether those 10 line of, lines of codes were actually a more elegant way of solving the problem than those 20 lines of code or vice versa. Um, so, so, so in itself, it's not a valuable uh, metric, but combined with either uh, um, samples of, of function point counting or anything, stuff like that, or the systematic analysis of the code itself uh, um, by, by using, using programs, uh, that will allow you to get an idea of, of, of will, will allow you to get some kind of productivity measures because you can translate basically, you can basically say something about the, the, the actual productivity of, the, of a team. We'll get back. Now we have, I'm, I'm, this is just our methodology in, in, uh, in, 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 in raw form, uh, just saying there's a, there's, there's a benchmarking component uh, in which we have some normalization parameters and there's a number of, of, of data sources that goes in, into, into that. So, so let's not, yeah. Now, the, we discussed that, uh, Revision I've discussed this. This is an actual uh, dump of data uh, from, from, a, um, from a client uh, where we see, okay, so what's going on here, basically? Squad one and two, they're spending all their time on AMS. Now, this could be a deliberate choice, saying uh, we, we, we basically push all the AMS work to squad one and two, or squad one and two are working on parts of the uh, landscape where the job right now actually is. Uh, indeed, for the, for the past 10 years, from an agile perspective, the idea in terms of scale was let's have more of the same kind of course. cross-functional teams that should work on. on. We try to give them a different uh, part, different area of the of the entire domain, so they can work more independently. But lately, and this is uh, quite recent developments in terms of organizational, uh, agile organizational thinking, is to organize your teams in a different way with um, the thinking that one team can be more of a support function to other teams. And that means practically that you can have a platform team. You can have a, a complex component team if there's a very tricky database that you want to integrate in the mass. And you have a couple of teams that are uh, more traditionally focused on producing uh, value for users, which you call stream aligned teams. And if that is the case, then this picture that we see here is not strange. So, oh. so basically, if, if this was what you expected, fine. What about squad six? Was that what you expected? It might be what you expected, or it might be a warning sign. Squad three and four, they're on 25 right now. Now we are, we are getting to a point where with those two teams where we should consider whether, I mean, on those two teams, you should probably be watching whether that, that goes up because then you, you will be moving into a territory where you'll get less and less output. So, so th th this is just uh, to say you need to have, uh, you need to get those kind of, of, of readings here, those kind of, of, of output and then you, of course, you, you need to put your, 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 your context on top of that. Now, this is an, in, we will be back, don't worry. But this is, uh, this is an example of, of, uh, of an actual benchmarking conducted in, 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 with a client where we actually said, okay, so during this sprint or during this period of time where we've measured, 
we've spent um, uh, 50, it's not a sprint, I can see that. So it's probably the entire art over, uh, or the, uh, we spent a number of hours. Um, we had a, um, a an AMS uh, percentage of 65. Uh, and if we look at that, and 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 and, and, and I mean, this, this is probably a team that was allocated to do a lot of AMS. Now, what we can say is this was a very expensive way of doing this. It it could have been, you said, okay, but we can't we can't perform whatever we're performing without uh, uh, having AMS in house or whatever. But it's a very expensive way to do it. And here's another one. This is a more traditional one where where AMS is 23 percent, and 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 whether you will accept that or not, you w be aware that it is an extremely expensive way of doing that. And this is not untypical that that you are seeing. It's not like it's 20 or 30 percent more expensive. No, it's it's three times more expensive to do this. And, and I think this is something that, that a lot of corporations don't really appreciate, that that AMS within an art is extremely expensive. So, so this is uh, this is the, the and, and, and you should consider offloading that as the larger software uh, software producers do, uh, they would they would have moved a proportion of this into a different setting, into a different organizational setup. Yep. Yeah, I think we need to, I think we'll skip those because I think I think it's uh, it's time for, for basically you to take over uh, and <coughs> talk a little about how we can measure basically quality and productivity. Yes, indeed. Taking a step back, when we, uh, are in the position and when organizations are in the position starting with agile in the beginning everything is fine any organization uh, producing a service or a product uh, something that is software driven has uh, the objective of speed and producing business and in terms of agile that translates <laughs> translates to the short iterations that the agile methodology prescribes and the value should come out of the working deliveries that you get after every iteration. And in the beginning, this feels great. There is a blank slate and teams can start uh, maybe even with some scaffolding and uh, they're quickly up and running, producing prototypes, producing new functionality, every new sprint. So that is great. And it's, like, it's like a party that starts with champagne. Exactly. Everybody is happy. Yeah. Is the next best thing. <laughs> but then, after a while, um, then when you finally think, ah, things uh, have really uh, started to roll and we uh, we are in control and we're we're moving ahead on our business roadmap, that is when uh, this eerie feeling starts to creep in of, wait, we're we're not doing as well as we we were at the beginning, and there are a number of different things there. Uh, first of all. Uh, you see uh, a, a slight downward trend in terms of what is delivered versus what is planned for at the sprint. And you think generally, uh, oh, this is a temporary thing. For example, uh, with COVID uh, uh, hitting us all over the world, you think, okay, that's a temporary, temporary setback. But this is actually something that continues. Another thing that you can experience is that functionality is delivered but not really fully as it was uh, uh, planned for at the start, as you had discussed it with your product owners as part of your business roadmap. And especially when you're counting on it for an important deadline, maybe a, a, a trade show or something like that, a conference, or you want to showcase that or, or have an important client visiting, yeah, then this partial delivery is, uh, is very, very inconvenient. Now, another thing is that you uh, have teams working on these iterations and you expect things to work. There is uh, the end of the iteration where there is a delivery and that delivery is supposed to be working software. And uh, it can be the case that what is demoed looks all great. And then when you actually start using it, you discover all kinds of issues. And that is really not the contract that you implicitly had 
signed with your expectations of the Agile team. Now, what do companies then generally do? They notice one team is less uh, productive. There's less output coming out of the team, but we still have this roadmap and we still have the deadline. So what, what can we do? Well, let's scale up. Let's add more teams because maybe the output of one team is a bit lower, lower than at the start. But if we have four or five, then we can, uh, this is the best one, then we can make up for it for what we lost. And, and Ravish is, uh, I have to say, yesterday, Ravish and I found out that we have one favorite book, book in common. Yeah. That, and I think we, we belong to a very limited number of people who actually read that book. Yeah. It's called The Mythical Man Month. And it actually, yeah, it, and, and uh, if you can get hold of that book, it, it's written in the 70s. And it actually is about this problem, about how putting more people on a software project uh, doesn't really solve the problem and why it doesn't. And, and it, it has all the mathematics about that in some cases, if you have a product project close to the end, but, but, but uh, getting too late, and you put more people on, it will actually take longer. Yeah, exactly. It, that, that's the beauty of, and, and the beauty of the book is that it actually demonstrates how there's not a linear uh, correlation between the number of people and the time to complete. It actually, in some cases, it reaches a point where putting more people will make you spend more time, not just man hours, more calendar time getting finished. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And surprisingly, even though we knew that from back then, and now in the agile world, when we apply the same thing with teams, the expectation is that it will be different. Well, what happens uh, after scaling up and having all these different teams working is that the uh, output collectively of all those teams is still lower than expected. It's not that linear scaling that uh, everybody was aiming for. So what is the problem there? What, how can this be the case? Well, the, the root cause there from a technical, from a software perspective is that there isn't enough attention to how exactly the systems, system or systems are built. Everybody is looking at the top of the iceberg and saying, hey, we're getting less than what we expected over time, but they don't know about all the problems that lurk beneath the surface. So what you're saying is it actually matters how you actually code this stuff it matters a hundred percent from day one from day one if we talk about this this idea about uh, the split of application maintenance versus development uh, uh, traditionally it is assumed that well you you start building an application and once it's in a let's say uh, 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 got to a stage that you can release it then we can start doing maintenance but that is really not true Maintenance starts with the very first line of code. And you want to limit how much maintenance you do there. Great. So the problem here is you don't know what is uh, what the problems are. You don't know how the system is built. And that uh, makes you, uh, well, not realize why it is uh, the case that there is lower output, uh, especially over time of the agile teams. And this is where we can make a difference because we uh, at SIG have developed a methodology for measuring software quality. And this is a peer published uh, methodology. And we have also written a book about it on how to write better code. And we have established a way to measure code quality in a benchmark way because we also love benchmarks. And it allows us to express a system's quality in a star score, ranging from one to five, which you see here on the left-hand side. And we have done this all over the world for over 20 years. And uh, by doing that and analyzing over 60 billion lines of code, we have uh, uh, built this benchmark, benchmark that you see here. And uh, this benchmark shows that uh, systems uh, have all kinds of different quality ratings. But the X axis shows the size of the system. And as you can see, the larger the system gets, the lower their quality rating tends to be. Why is that? That is, and this follows also from intuition, if there is more to deal with mm. or code, then that is harder to work with. If you, 
it's maybe taken. But, but, okay, and, and, and more code to work with means you make more mistakes. You, uh, the quality, I mean, yeah. It, it might be, yeah, okay. There, there's simply more ground to cover. It's it's uh, the difference between cleaning a, a small apartment or a big palace. There's more work to do. That is just one thing. But when it comes to software specifically is complexity. There's a complexity of the domain and the larger the system uh, gets, the more of uh, domain complexity you're trying to capture in code. And that becomes harder and harder to deal with. Definitely for humans, because while our computing abilities uh, really increased exponentially throughout uh, the last uh, 70 years, our human capability stays the same. So we not we can't capture more complexity as, okay. as humans. So this is what we do. We are able to uh, uh, rate a software uh, quality in terms of star scores. And that is something that is interesting to look at when uh, you compare two systems of uh, the same functionality. Here we see uh, two systems, one on the left and uh, system two on the right, that do the same but are built very differently in terms of quality. And the, the colors that you see, the, the little blocks, they represent uh, blocks of code uh, that uh, are different in, uh, in, in length or you could say different in complexity. So whereas the system on the left has much lower complexity, the system on the right has much higher complexity. And that is essentially what we benchmark and what we then rate. So just for me to understand, on the left you have basically the, the big uh, scattered paga on, on the right side of that graph. That, that is a huge proportion of the code that's actually quite simple. Yeah, and, and, that's, then, and that's exactly what you want. And that's what you want, because that, that, then that's easily maintainable. Yes. That's, uh, yeah. So, so and, and then moving to, to the left on, on that graph, you'll see uh, on, the, on the very left, you have those parts that are quite complex, but compared to the right graph, they are much lower. Exactly. And, and, uh, and, 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 and there's only one row of them where you have several rows uh, on the right. Yeah, and this is also the point because uh, our uh, approach is not to uh, get the use perfect code that is all green. That doesn't make sense because there is uh, a cost benefit ratio to this. And mm -hmm. The goal is not to produce perfect code. The code is to produce business value through the features it, it provides. So uh, complexity is, is allowed, that is fine. But you don't want too much, as you can see on the right hand mm. side here. And how much is too much is not something that we determine, but that is something that the benchmarks uh, benchmark gives us. Mm, so great. it's a market uh, indicated, market driven uh, indicator for, for your quality. Now that has a consequence, uh, the system on the left versus the system on the right. You see here in the, in the bottom that we compare the uh, the volume, how much code is there in between those systems, uh, the amount of technical debt, because this approach of ours for measuring quality allows us to uh, measure the amount of technical debt. And based on the size and the technical debt, we can calculate what the, in terms of software uh, development effort is, the amount of maintenance. So just for, I mean, what you did here was those two systems, and I, I guess this is a, a model approach because you have two systems that does the same, which we rarely have, uh, but, but, but this is what we have here. You basically took the code and put it through your machine. Yes. And out of that machine came those two graphs and those metrics down there, telling us that system two actually requires close to double the effort in maintenance. Exactly. Exactly, and that is the whole point. You talked about, uh, and we talked earlier about this split between application maintenance and application development. If you have a system, if, if your agile teams are, are working on a, uh, on a system that is on, looks like the, the right one here, then your ratio of application maintenance is much higher. And just to say, I mean, so, so the 6.5 and the 12.1, those are what you would expect maintenance should be based on uh, based on your your benchmarking numbers yeah uh, and 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 the measurement of the complexity now just to to make sure what 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 the, the way we go around this is of course we actually 
look at the actual problems, the actual incidents, so yeah. and and the actual uh, hours spent on that. Those two can be compared, uh, obviously, to see if there's a discrepancy. So if system one is our system, we would expect it to be 6.5 uh, FT per year. We can then we would then measure what is it really? Well, that is exactly uh, you are measuring what it comes out of having uh, a, the difference between the left picture or the right picture. Yeah. If there's much red and orange in your system, as you can see there, then you will see much more of those tickets that you can measure as application maintenance. So low quality results in much more issues. Obviously, and and you can then check. Yeah. It's extremely interesting, I think, this this one, this approach. So, yeah, let's move on. All right. So, what is the result there? Uh, the result is that you get less output, less productivity than what you expect. You might have this setup on the left that you have four teams and, and you have a total of 32 FTE. And every iteration, every sprint, you expect the output uh that that you would expect from this many developers but the reality then uh, from the software quality is that if there is so much red in there much more of your developers are spending their time on maintenance and that means that you have much less capacity for uh what you call ad or application development for producing the output that you're looking for the beauty here i think is i just our approach is, is, the, is the top down approach. We, we're just looking at stuff saying, okay, so what do you spend your time on? Now, what you, what you offer here is the explanation. Exactly. Why is it like that? Is it actually the quality? Because quality in software development will have this consequence. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I think, do you have a computer science background or something yeah, like absolutely, that? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So do I, uh, and, and a number of people do, and, and they will be uh, able to actually go in and look at code and say, oh, this is crappy code, this is good code. But in general, that that kind of skill is uh, is not is not available, typically not available in the in the governance layer uh, of, of, uh, of agile development uh, organizations. Yeah, or in enterprise organizations. So, so the ability to actually measure the quality of the code is, is one that's missing, and you providing basically a tool that can do that. And I can't wait to see that tool. Yeah. So, so are we getting there soon? Uh, actually, yeah, we're we're getting that now. Uh, um, after <laughs> it's, uh, it's okay. No, no, don't don't rush yeah. it. So, so, so one thing is, uh, as we talked about, you have less capacity uh, for a. Uh, for a system if it's lower quality, because uh, a part of your developers are just not producing uh, new features. Another thing that is uh, often uh, uh, lurking beneath the surface and that organizations are not aware of is the, the lack of full um, uh, independent uh, operation of the different teams, independent working. Independence, that's the word I was looking for. Independence between the different teams uh, is uh, initially assumed to be uh, realized by just assigning different business areas to different teams. So we say, okay, one team uh, is working on area A, another on B, another one B. But if you do not take care of the quality of your applications, and also this is something that scales beyond a single application, but actually across your portfolio, as we can see here, there are many more dependencies that exist between systems. Some, some that are explicitly there, but also some that are implicitly there. And what you get from that is that those different teams that you have uh, formed, that you want to work independently, and you're expecting them to yeah, be very productive, are actually much less productive because they aren't as independent as you think they are. Because the area that team B is working on also has some dependencies on the area that uh, team uh, B or area B is working on. And funny enough, you know, th this is actually back to our book from, uh, I think, 1974. Yeah. I, th I think this is actually uh, a point in that book, yeah. is that this is what's so special about software development, is that carving out the jobs in different 
and you need to do that. You need to say T area A, area C, team A, team C. You need to do that, but doing that has a special price to it. If if you if you do, if you do not realize the interdependencies and actually handle them as you go along. Yeah, and and this is something that the the safe framework is actually trying to address with with the the idea of the program board, board. Mm. because if you don't specifically look for it, all these dependencies, implicit and explicit, are definitely there. But teams discover them very late uh, at the end of the sprint, and then you cannot produce what you had planned at the start. Safe we have a right? sorry, we have a question. May, may I post it now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, How it's from uh, CERN uh, from Truck. Uh, why does developers produce bad quality code? <laughs> That's a very good question. A uh, very good question. Uh, no developer sets out to produce quality code. That to start with. Unless they are hired by foreign uh, foreign powers that, that wants to, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> Unless there are malicious uh, purposes. Uh, but uh, no developer has, has this intent. There are a couple of uh, factors there. One is ability. If developer developers do not have the experience that Henrik talked about earlier, then they simply don't know how to write better code. And uh, surprisingly enough, actual enterprise software engineering is not taught in uh, not in universities at least. Uh, so you learn it on the job, and it depends on uh, which mentors you have in the technical domain at the job. If you have one of those super experienced developers uh, as a team lead, then you can learn it. Otherwise, uh, you don't. So that is one thing. And a second thing is, well, especially for those who have uh, this uh, computer science background. You may be familiar with Conway's law. Um, Conway's law says that uh, organizations will end up producing systems that uh, mimic their organizational structure. These dependencies that you see here, they are the result of the commu communication lines that exist in the organizational hierarchy. So that is something that developers do not have control of. That that is something that develops. That you actually hardwire the organization yeah. into the enterprise architecture in some way. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that is uh, one thing. And then the last thing is simply business pressure. If the pressure is to produce new functionality every sprint and and uh, and the client is expecting to be wowed every time then what uh, developer teams will do, and especially in a vendor uh, outsourced uh, situation, is they will produce those things that garner the most applause, which is not necessarily doing things right, because doing things right is uh, slower. And you will find organizations where you have these uh, grumpy old men that just, just insist on producing beautiful uh, maintainable code, and in some cases, they are just described as as such as grumpy old men who insist on doing things in their own way, and they're pretty slow, and they're always uh, making making a fuss. Yeah. But those are actually the people trying to insist, in many cases, insisting on the high quality. So, so we, and and I think, I think a final thing uh, remark here is. When you go to and and, and look at uh, bricklayers or, or or whatever kind of profession, you'll find that there is a certain uh, there's a certain variance in productivity and in quality. But when it comes to coding, the variance is much bigger. Yeah. So so if you have a group of a hundred programmers, the uh, the variance between the least productive and the most productive and that the one producing the, the worst and the best code can be a factor of five or even 10. It's just, it, it's not 50% or 60%. It, it is actually a, 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 an order of magnitude uh, yeah. that's much bigger than you're, us than, than you're used to. Yeah, and one very important element here is that we should not forget that output is not the same as outcome. Exactly. So you want your developers to be productive, but you want them to produce things that are very valuable to your customers. Now, that is a very difficult thing because it requires two things from a, from development teams. One is expertise in what we call the solution domain or a technical expertise of how to write good code, well maintainable code. And the other is uh, domain knowledge. To actually know to to uh, build functionality that produces business value. 
And that combination is super hard to establish. And and going back to, I think the question is, a, is just on the point that, that we are trying to uh, address here. Inexperienced programmers produce worse code than, than experienced programmers. So team composition, if, if you want the less experienced programmers or coders to actually produce quality code, put them together with more experience and make sure that you have some kind of, of, of uh, process and system in place that allows these people to learn from each other. So, yeah. so, so, so that, that, that is really the solution to this. Obviously, there are people that will never learn it and they should pursue another career because coding is, is far too important to, to basically live with people that, that will never grasp this. Yeah. But, but, but basically, I believe that generally it's, it's a belief that less experienced people can learn a lot, but not by themselves. Yes. And then what you can do is measure what is going on. Okay, let's get, I mean, we, we, can't, we can't wait now. Yeah. So we need to go to the demonstration. I need to, pre you need to get the keyboard Thank and you. the mouse pad. And I will, I think this is, yes. Okay. So here we are looking at the platform that we have built, which is called Secret. And you should uh, pretend now that we are looking at an organization or even your organization, because we have a picture here of uh, the different applications that uh, exist in that portfolio. Now we're looking at, uh, this is a demonstration portfolio, so these are all open source systems, so I can actually share this data. Uh, and uh, this is a portfolio of 45 systems in total. Now you see here a picture of different colors. And that is actually the color coding that we have applied to that star rating that we use for indicating software quality. So that star rating goes from one to five stars. It's a benchmarked rating, meaning that three stars represents market average, market average build quality. You want to be higher than that to in four or five stars uh, because there you have higher quality and that means that you're not overspending and that is where you get more output, so a lower uh, ratio of application maintenance, and that would be green or uh, dark green. And you do not want to be lower than the market average with two stars being orange and one star uh, being red. Now, what you see here is a very typical uh, portfolio. In most organizations, this is what you would see. Mostly yellow, some orange, and a little bit of green. Now, from a cost perspective, what you want to do is steer actively your internal development teams or your vendor towards greener pastures, seeing more green systems in here. And there we recommend to go for green and not dark green because there is a cost benefit ratio and the law of diminishing returns applies here. So this is what we have and what we can uh, show for a portfolio and that you can apply to know what is really going on beneath the surface of uh, those applications that the Agile teams are developing. And just for me to understand, so, so what you're saying is, we have yellow, we have orange. Orange, that's not so good. Uh, yeah, uh, no, sorry, dark orange, uh, is, the, the orange part is, is not that good. Great, yeah. So, so we, 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 and we could invest in getting that to, to become yellow, that would be an investment. Uh, correct, yeah. Uh, um, and and that would and and the orange basically represent what we could call technical debt. Exactly, and and you want to address this technical debt. Now, uh, don't be so scared. We don't say if you have a situation like this, you should remove all technical debt. Mm -hmm. It is way too costly. So you want to uh, address technical debt to where it makes sense. And this is uh, where we have a method for. Uh, uh, calculating how much technical debt there is and then estimating the development effort required to take it to a green level. So if, if you take the financial, the, the economists uh, approach to this, you would say, okay, I could, I could choose to spend some of my capital on, on, on removing the technical debt. Exactly. That would be a, a, a return on, that would be a business case in itself. It's a business case of for how much should I invest right now in a moment in time to reduce the ongoing cost. And I'm looking at those money and you, you tell me it's uh, 50 million Danish kroner, it's, uh, yeah. it's 75 million Danish kroner or 10 million yeah. euros. And, um, and, and I say, mm, 
I, I think I'd, I think I'd rather spend those money on on, on building my new uh, web shop, right? Right. So then, then in that case, I would just have to accept that this is the landscape. Yeah. And and this will drive cost in developing new stuff in maintaining the existing landscape. So basically, you are saying this gives you a picture on which you can now start operating and calculating what will be the consequence of doing A, B, and C. Absolutely. And then also, this is uh, the information that you can use to accept and understand why there is a lower output. Exactly. So, so this will also say, so the guys working on the TensorFlow, they will be, they they will be less productive than the one on the at the at the head up uh, or the uh, or the MongoDB. Yeah, exactly. And if you do not do. want to invest into uh, making TensorFlow uh, yellow or even green, yeah, then you have to accept. Uh, that that they have a higher ratio of maintenance. Mm. Let's move on. In yeah. So this is a a, a moment in time picture. Now um, you can also track this in terms of a trend graph because that is what you want to steer on. Uh, from a more managerial perspective, you want to look at that from a quarterly perspective. So I can select a quarter to date and then see how things are developing okay now this is getting interesting if so basically if if we assume that we have a team yeah. working on one of these in our agile program we can actually see what they did to the code yes so so did did their work actually increase the quality or did it, it did it result in a poorer quality of yeah. the code so this is a good measure of of what they actually did and whether they were producing good or bad code, and 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 we can we can now start we cannot start discussing okay how, how should we actually tackle that because we don't want the code to become worse in quality. No, exactly. And what is a, an important thing to look at is that if you don't want to invest into improving the quality and thereby reducing your ongoing cost, uh, your recurring cost, then you could at least say well. Uh, as a rule, the teams uh, should make sure that the quality doesn't further decrease because that would in increase your uh, running cost. And that is something we see here, for example, with this system called Bitcoin. Yeah, that one uh, decreased in time. Mm. So that is an, an development that you don't want to have. Exactly. Now, I'll go back to, to this uh, tree map view. So, so just for me to understand. So, yeah. so, so we, we put in all the code. And and this is the picture we get. We can put all the code in in a week's time. Yeah. And and uh, we get a new picture. Yes. And 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 we do that. How how often would you do that? So uh, that is something that we uh, configure together with our clients, but we would say as often as possible. Yeah. yeah. And especially any time the code. And is full, this is a there, there's no. Uh, I mean, there's no black magic here, or all the black magic is in the software. You don't do anything. No, no, this is all fully automated. And it's based on uh, on what? How do you actually? How do you actually um, decide? How does the program decide whether it's yellow, whether it's uh, orange, or whether it's green? Yeah, good question. And I'll I'll explain it by going into one of these systems. And here we see the system details mm. of, of this particular system called Postgres. And you see these blocks here, those are the components of the system, again, with the same uh, color coding. But your question of how do we get to this is answered with this uh, card here. Because mm. in this card, you see a number of uh, metrics that we measure statically on any system. And it doesn't matter which uh, programming language is, is used. We use that on COBOL, Java, C Sharp, JavaScript, doesn't matter. And uh, each of those different metrics get their own rating. And also here, they are color coded. So you can see that the red ones indicate poor coding practices in this case. And what we do is we measure all of these metrics on any code base compare their results to the benchmark, and then we get these scores, and that gets aggregated into that overall score for maintainability. So when I was a programmer many years ago, working uh, in a company with very, very skilled programmers, one of, one of the guys said, used to say to me, okay, I can write the most complex 
I can solve the most complex problems uh, of all times in one line of C code. Yeah. And he was right, yeah. but no one, no one was able to actually untangle that that line of C code afterwards. Oh, exactly. So, so that would that would show out how. Uh, would that be in, in unit complexity or? Yeah, it would uh, show here in, uh, in in unit size and, and in the complexity. Yeah, so, so, so it would be very complex. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is actually something that we get back from developers from time to time. You get some pushback and they say, oh yeah, but this is a special case and uh, and uh, we know what the, uh, where the complexity is, so it is okay. Well, first of all, uh, as, I, as I explained earlier, we don't say that things have to be all perfect. You don't have to mm. have all five stars. Uh, it's allowed to have complexity, as and that is part of. Yeah, or the complexity could be, I mean, intrinsic to to the problem you're solving. Yes, but that's actually a very good one. A complex uh, business domain does not require complex code. Uh, okay, good, good. That is not a, a linear relationship or one to one. But you will have. Oh, I'm just asking, would you have mathematically complex problems that would require complex code, or do you even believe that that can be basically untangled in a, in a less complex way? Exactly. So, yeah, oh, okay. first solving the problem, mm. problem is very... Uh, Back to my colleague from before. Complex. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. You, yeah. That is actually what enterprise software engineering is about, because uh, we first say, okay, you can have complexity, but the most important point here is that Enterprise software engineering is not a uh, sole uh, activity. Programming is a sole activity. One programmer is writing something. Mm. But enterprise software engineering is a social activity. If you have written very complex code, Henrik, and it's a nice one-liner, and I need to take over your system. Exactly. I have Which is what I said to my colleague at the <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah, that, that is impossible. So that is what we show here. Uh, Ravish? Time is running. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just looking at the watch. We have uh, eight minutes left. So, so there's one thing I want to mm. show here in in terms of uh, the agile connection and tracking uh, iterations. You can see here with something that is called delta quality uh, what the difference is in uh, in quality with the previous sprint and and the latest sprint. Mm. So this is really going in and say, okay, these guys worked now for two weeks on this sprint. Yeah. What was the result of the code they were working on? Exactly. So this is the output that we could take into our more benchmarking and, and uh, whatever. So, so this is where the pieces meet really. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and what, what you're doing there is really showing... Uh, for different metrics, we are showing for new code as well as uh, changed code for, for example, a bug fix or something. Um, we are showing what the quality is of, of the new code. And there you can see whether uh, the teams are working on reducing this application maintenance to development ratio or not. But this is not good, right? What we're looking at right now is it's bad. Not, no, yeah. no, because uh, the, the key number is 1.3, but the, the upper left corner is. Yeah. Yeah. So the new code they developed was of quality 1.3 on the one to five yes. scale. That's not good. And, and then we see the explanation basically on on the uh, on the five boxes. Exactly. And then just extrapolate this over six months time, then the overall quality will be lower and you will get more of red in that system like I showed in the previous. And this is my this is my old colleague Pierre. <laughs> so uh, so I can say Pierre, you actually contributed with a with a lot of, of very complex code. Exactly. Uh, that uh, that will uh, make this very difficult to maintain for uh, Henrik and, and the other guys. Yeah. Mm? Good. Um, so this is a way to basically objectify what happened in that sprint. Yeah. From in an automated way. Yes. And 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 what you can do is you can take these basically to the programmers and then you can start discussing. Okay, was there a very good reason for this? But even, I mean, and, and what you would say and what we would say from a benchmarking, a financial benchmarking point of view would be, no matter how good the reasons are, <laughs> and back to, to what you said before, uh, no matter how good the reasons are, what you've done right now yeah. is you made this a more expensive code complex to Thanks. maintain, and we don't really like that. No, no, exactly. So, so uh, and then we can go down and discuss quality based on, on, on this more granular level uh, and discuss what would be uh, the ways to move forward here. Exactly.
but we don't have so much time so let's talk a bit about what people can do about it yeah yeah let's do that uh, i will go back to da, 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 da. isn't it here it is um yes so uh, what can you then uh, do to get more value for your money? And this from the software engineering perspective, the development perspective. Well, first of all, uh, get better contracts, improve your contracts. Uh, you can use uh, Zangenberg for getting an idea about the cost of the different elements in the contracts. And as I uh, explained earlier, you can put in clauses for uh, specific quality requirements. And it's important there to be specific because if you just write high quality, then your vendor will say, yes, we will purchase high quality. Of course, there's a difference in understanding there. And I think it's fair to say that, I mean, please uh, reach out and then we'll be more than happy to uh, to help the, the discussions about how you can improve your contracts, obviously. Yeah. yeah, so that is one thing. So that is the starting point. Then as things are ongoing, as you have agile development, Make sure that you are monitoring the quality mm. continuously. And that is where we have this platform for. And then, of course, lastly, uh, like Henrik already said, you can get advice into specific cases. Yeah, and some of that advice will be from very technically savvy people helping you to improve the quality by educating uh, programmers, whatever. Others yeah. would be in, in, in terms of providing your vendor with your KPIs and, and your measurements and saying, this just doesn't work. I mean, you need to improve there and there and there. We won't accept these, kind, these kind of quality measures. Yeah, absolutely. So well, thank you very much. Stay tuned for, for more, um, for more uh, web, webcasts from, from here and perhaps more joint webcasts with SIG. Um, so thank you and very, yeah, see you thank soon. You, yeah. Thank you.